DiscerningHearts.com presents The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. Dr. Bunsen serves as the faculty chair of the Catholic Distance University. He is also a senior fellow at the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. He is the author or co-author of over 45 books, including the Pope Encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia of Catholic History, the Encyclopedia of Saints, the Encyclopedia of U.S. Catholic History, and Pope Francis. Dr. Bunsen serves as a senior contributor for EWTN. The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Matthew. It's great to be with you again, Chris. Today we explore the life and teachings of Pope St. Leo the Great. He was born in the year 400, correct? Uh, yes, uh, he was of uh, Tuscan descent. So in other words, he, he was very much a, uh, an Italian. Uh, he was uh, of the Italian nobility. And his family, unfortunately, is not really that well known. Uh, we know that uh, by the time he was in his 30s, he was serving as a deacon. But that does little by way of expressing the immense respect uh, with which he was held by not just the, the Romans, but by Christians literally all over the church. Think, for example, of the fact that one of the other doctors of the church that we talked about, and that's Cyril of Alexandria, asked for his help in a dispute with uh, Juvenal of Jerusalem over the, the jurisdiction of that patriarchate in the Holy Land. We have as well a treatise that uh, John Cassian dedicated to him. It was written against heresy. And then we have in Leo somebody who was trusted by the secular rulers of the time. And that was he was chosen uh, by the imperial government to travel to Gaul to settle a dispute between two of the Roman officials. And so this was somebody who, in terms of the papal administration, was much trusted, but who was also a very deeply respected intellect, mediator, and person of, of great integrity. It is for that reason that he was elected in 440, in September of that year, to succeed Pope Sixtus III. And he was, in fact, elected while he was away uh, on that mission to Gaul. Can you give us some perspective on the state of the church during this era, but also the state of Rome and its holdings with, throughout the world? The era in which Leo lived uh, was one of immense upheaval both in terms of the church, but also and especially in terms of uh, the Roman Empire. In the church, we had been dealing with, and you and I, in talking about different doctors of the church, we've discussed many times the heresies that plagued the church, especially from the start of the fourth century, when the church was finally freed from persecutions and then had to grapple with these different heretical ideas that emerged. The most prevalent, of course, was Arianism that called into question the divinity of Christ. In Leo's time, there was a, a new set of heresies emerging. The church in, four, in the 430s had dealt with the, the crisis of Nestorianism that called into question again the, the nature of Christ. In Leo's time, there was another one emerging, and, and that began to question Christ's humanity. And so we see these tendencies to swing to great poles of excess, of extremism. On the one hand, denying Christ's divinity. On the other, denying his humanity. And in that middle is the authentic teachings of the church. And it was to be Leo's task, as we're going to talk about, to defend and to articulate those teachings. We also had the reality that because of the breakdown of imperial civilization, I'm going to talk about in a second, the authority, the rightful place of the popes, uh, was itself being called into question. The rightful authority of the bishops of Rome over the seas of the church. We have competitors emerging uh, to 
the rightful place of the popes. And, for example, the, the Patriarchate of Constantinople, the Patriarchate of Alexandria, and even in, in some cases the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. These, these great patriarchates that saw themselves as would-be rivals to the authority of the bishops of Rome. Now, the position of the bishops of Rome, as I said, was complicated because Roman imperial civilization was itself in its final death throes, certainly in the West. In the East, you had the reconstituted Eastern Empire. You had this very powerful political force to the East based in Constantinople. In the West, though, you had the slow, painful death of the Western Empire. So that by the time of Leo's election, the city of Rome had been eclipsed completely by Constantinople, but also by, in the West, uh, another great city called Mediolanum, or Milan, that we think associate, of course, with St. Ambrose. So Rome was in great danger, just as the entire West was in great danger. So Leo, in coming to the papal throne in 400, was confronted with these two intertwined realities of serving as Bishop of Rome as head of the universal church, but also of confronting the immense dangers that were facing the West, that were facing the eternal city itself. Many people are familiar with one of those great dangers in the form of quite a titan of a figure called Attila. Yes. <laughs> Can you care to share that story? Yeah, absolutely. Probably the most famous event in the, and, and indeed in the life of Pope Leo, came in 452. The, the Huns were an Asiatic people who had been pushed ever westward by the, the grand migration of tribes from the east. And they literally stormed into Western Europe. And the Huns were devastating everything in their path. They were on the verge of completely annihilating the West, the Western Empire, when they received a, a very bloody defeat, a, a check at the Battle of Chalon in 451 by a grand host of Roman forces and of the Goths, who themselves were deeply worried about being destroyed by these Huns. It gives you an idea of how dangerous the Huns were. Mm -hmm. Defeated in Gaul, Attila turned south, and he had as his objective to sack the cities of the Italian peninsula, and did so uh, at Aquileia, and then, as invaders always did, began marching straight for Rome for its wealth, uh, but also the sheer symbolism of having sacked the great city of Rome, the eternal city, what had been for centuries, certainly in the eyes of the barbarians throughout Europe, the, the head of the world, the, the capital of the world. To meet him, there were virtually no Roman officials left. There were certainly no armies left to stop him. And so, Leo took it upon himself as the last real legitimate leader in Italy to meet with Attila. Now, it's hard to know exactly what happened uh, at that meeting. Uh, the events are not in dispute. Leo most definitely met with Attila. And they met probably near uh, what was modern Lake Garda. And we know that immediately after that meeting, uh, Attila retreated and did not sack Rome. And of course, it's a matter of historical record that he died soon after under what were unusual, perhaps very suspicious circumstances. Whatever it was that Leo said to him was enough to prevent the, the sack and probably the destruction of the city of Rome. And it's a testament to his abilities as a negotiator, but also, uh, I think, his sheer spiritual strength, that he could actually accomplish what virtually no other ruler anywhere in the West or the Eastern Empire could have accomplished. And he did this entirely on his own. Now, it's one of the tragedies that a mere three years later, another army invaded Italy. 
this time the Vandals under their ruler, Gazeric. And Leo tried to intervene, tried to prevent them from sacking the city of Rome, but um, he could not prevent the Vandals from doing so, in part because the, the Vandals were more determined uh, than Attila to make a political point against the Roman Empire. However, Leo was still able to accomplish something very important, and that is that the mass murder that probably would have happened uh, without his intervention uh, did not take place. The, the, the Roman people themselves were spared from the sort of terrible massacre that the Vandals were typically known for uh, inflicting, and uh, the city was not put to the torch after it was sacked, and the churches themselves, the, the great churches of the time in Rome, were also spared. Is there a modern-day equivalent to this type of wave action of aggression that might help us to be able to wrap our brains around why this was such an unbelievable occurrence? It would be akin, I think, to the the Pope's in the 20th century, talking someone like Adolf Hitler out of invading Russia or out of uh, waging cruel war on Poland. Um, the spiritual power of Leo, I think, was enough to deter Attila and lessen the aggression of the Vandals. The history of the papacy is, in fact, one of powerful mediation. And... It is a true tragedy that the world has not listened to the popes on a more regular basis. I think of Benedict XV and his immediate predecessor, Pius X, both trying to prevent and then halt the bloodbath of World War I. I think also, of, of course, of Pius XII urging uh, Hitler and the, the rest of the world from sinking into the abyss of the Second World War. And uh, I can think also of uh, Pope John Paul II trying to stop uh, things like the Iraq War from taking place in, in 2003. So the, the popes have always been uh, prophetic and very powerful spiritual voices, uh, even to secular leaders who are determined uh, to wage war for different reasons. And I'm not equating someone like George W. Bush with Attila the Hun, but the popes themselves have the, the greater purpose of trying to foster and nurture peace in the world. And Leo uh, stands in that very great tradition. But it probably wasn't just this event that would lift him up in the hearts of many to be the great St. Yes. Leo the Great, it, it had to have been based in something much deeper than that. Uh, it was. Uh, the first, of course, was his, his holiness. This was somebody who was a profoundly holy pope. And that alone um, is one of the reasons why he's called the Great. But he is remembered, especially as a doctor of the church, for two huge accomplishments. The first was doing everything he could to develop and also to reinstate the, the church's understanding of papal primacy. And the other, of course, was his incredible work uh, to resist heresy. In particular, uh, his writings that had a direct hand in shaping the, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 – uh, in particular, what was called his tome. And we can talk about both of those aspects of his papacy. Well, let's do that. The, the tome is something that can be accessed online, can it? And, it, and yes. it's worth doing so. Uh, it is. It is. Well, the tome really uh, flows in, in part from his efforts to bring about uh, a recentralization of the spiritual authority within the church, the rightful place of the popes, and of reaffirming uh, that papal authority. Now, we had seen in the previous 
century or so. Because, as I was saying, of the deteriorated conditions in the West, uh, but also because of the interference of the emperors in the East and the ambitions of the patriarchates in Constantinople and Alexandria, at times a neglect of the rightful authority of the popes. And in this sense, Leo went about very methodically involving himself uh, and in, in many cases being asked for his advice uh, in matters of jurisdiction, of doctrine, uh, and in helping people to remember that the popes are supposed to be the, the spiritual heads of the whole church. So he, you can, you can trace this in, in fascinating ways. In, in Africa, for example, uh, he helped to bring about uh, answers to questions of clerical discipline. Uh, he involved himself in different areas of life in Greece, uh, and, and that itself was um, somewhat complicated and, and controversial because of the ambitions of the patriarchs of Constantinople. Uh, for example, he, he wrote a letter to the successor, the Bishop of Thessalonica, and actually uh, criticized him and reproached him for his treatment of those bishops in his metropolitan province. And then, of course, we have um, his work in Italy itself to make certain that the sacraments were being celebrated properly. So he issued uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about a hundred and some letters uh, in which he was very systematic in reasserting uh, the place of the popes. And he also used his sermons to remind the church of the place of Peter, whose successor he was. And Leo himself had a very powerful devotion to St. Peter and understood his place as successor to St. Peter uh, and also his rightful apostolic authority and his inheritance of Peter's unique position in the, the, the church, but also as the head of the apostles. All of this flowing from his place as the office of Bishop of Rome and, of course, as Christ's vicar on earth. So he had a very profound theological understanding of his place as Pope. And then, as I said, was quite clear in applying that authority. And the, the zenith for that uh, really came in 451 in dealing with uh, the, the latest of the Christological heresies uh, that had to be dealt with. What would the name of that heresy be? Yes. Well... As I was saying, the, the church had been dealing with the Arian heresy and, and finally was able to put that to rest. Mm -hmm. We then had, as I was saying too, the movement in the other extreme of denying the basic humanity of Christ. And this was very complicated because the, the church was still trying to grapple with the specific language that would be most appropriate for describing Christ. And indeed, so many of these Christological heresies helped the church to define her language, not to sort of make up what she believed, but to express it properly. And this particular controversy that led to the Council of Chalcedon uh, came really into to fruition because of the writings of a priest by the name of Eutyches, uh, who was expressing this idea uh, of Christ's divinity sort of completely overshadowing uh, his humanity. So he basically argued that Christ's humanity was limited. Now, this is a question of back and forth as to what exactly he meant by that. And we have uh, in uh, the writings of Cyril of Alexandria, uh, some accused him of doing something very similar. So you had a, a council uh, that uh, 
was at first brought into being prior to uh, Chalcedon, and that, of course, is the Second Council of Ephesus uh, at 449, that became known as the Latrocinium, or the Robber Council. It was denounced thoroughly because it created uh, even more controversy than it ever settled. Why? Because, as is often the case with these heresies, they involve themselves with political rulers in the hopes of bullying and intimidating the church into accepting their wishes. And that's exactly what happened at uh, this Second Council of Ephesus, which uh, was soon denounced as the so-called robber council, and uh, its work was essentially repudiated. Once the political situation changed and you had a, a very orthodox, solid emperor, the name of Marcion, uh, they were able to reconvene a new council and one that was effectively free of the kind of brutal political intimidation that had marked uh, Ephesus and, and had actually marked previous councils um, that had to be repudiated before. So the Council of Chalcedon issued uh, what became known as a definition uh, that rejected the notion of a single nature in Christ and stated very clearly that he has two natures in one person, the, the hypostatic union, but defining definitively for all time that he has t two natures in one person, and that is human and divine. And the key document for this was Leo's work, and that was his famous tome. It's so important to appreciate that unity of the divinity of Christ and the humanity of Christ, because it ultimately will say something about our own selves and how we were created and, you know, expressed out in, in modern day writings of Pope John Paul II and theology of the body, the importance of understanding our spirit, but also the essence of who we are as in our bodies. Am I stretching it, Matthew, and saying that, no, you know, it helps us to understand why this is an important discussion? Yes, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And Leo's participation in this, even though he was not there in person, but he had his representatives who delivered, uh, who tried to deliver this tome to the Robert Council of Ephesus, but uh, uh, were effectively rejected, but then were able to bring it back to Chalcedon. And it was a perfect crystallization of what the church actually believed. You know, it, and the, that's the key to appreciating this, that Leo helped provide the language for understanding Christ and for creating a formula that is readily understood and that we profess today. So in other words, it's like coming up with a formula that describes something in nature that is clear, that is a fact, but that still needs to be defined properly in, in language that is appropriately precise. That's uh, decisively important because you're, you're taking what is a, an objective truth and finding the way of describing it fully and accurately. And that's where Leo was so valuable. And the, the genius of this tome this, uh, this letter that was originally written to Archbishop Flavian of Constantinople became this, this great formula of Western Christology. But you, you hit on the key word, Chris, and, and that is unity. Because what does the council report? The acts of the council state very clearly. After the reading of the foregoing epistle, the Reverend Bishops cried out, this is the faith of the fathers. This is the faith of the apostles. And then they added, anathema to him who does not believe. And then they added even more notably, Peter has spoken thus through Leo. So in this one major accomplishment at this, this, the Council of Chalcedon, Leo was able not only to help the church in having a clearer understanding of her Christology, an understanding of Christ, but he also secured from this council 
the recognition that he spoke with the voice of Peter. And this, I think, is so significant for the subsequent history of the development of papal supremacy, papal primacy in the church, and the fact that here in this early council, 451, the council itself readily agreed to it. The, the clarity of his statement on the human and divine nature of Christ. You know, the, the council said uh, that all with one consent teach the people to confess uh, the, the one and same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of, as they say, reasonable or rational soul and body, consubstantial with the Father and consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things, they say, like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhood, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, that they say, without confusion, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. I mean, this is beautiful language, uh, but we're seeing in this one statement from Chalcedon, bringing together a solution to so many of the heresies that had gone before, because this confession, this formula, makes clear that Christ is both God and man, that he is one person, but also it reaffirms that he was born of the Virgin Mary and it reiterates her title, Mother of God, that of course the, the Council of Ephesus had defended with such vigor uh, only 20 years before against another of the heresies of the Nestorians. So we're seeing Leo helping to pull together a host of different theological threads uh, that had been out there uh, in the previous century and helping the church in this one decisive moment uh, to understand then and for all time who the church understands Christ to be. Thank you so much, Dr. Bunsen. Oh, it's great to be with you, Chris. I look forward to our next episode. You've been listening to The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. To hear and or to download this episode, along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen.